So you need to use multiplication. One times one times one equals one. Because there's only one God. But this one God exists in three distinct persons. So they're Trinitarian verses. They're Trinitarian passages. The Trinity is not a, a, a little biblical teaching hiding up in some corner that we went and pulled out and made it, blew it up and made this big deal about. No, 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 no. It's all over the New Testament. Why? Because God wants you to understand that he's a Trinitarian God. That's the point. And if you want to get him right, you got to get that right. 1 Timothy 3.16 and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. That's how Acts 20, 28, God could shed his blood. Because God the Father sent God the Son, and he became incarnated. John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of, of God in him. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrated his love for us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God incarnate died for us. God the Son died for us. The Father did not die for us. The Spirit did not die for us. But God the Son became flesh and blood and died at Calvary. That's why human beings can be redeemed. That's why angels who sinned and became demons can't be redeemed. That's why animals can't be redeemed. Because Jesus became a man and died for mankind. He didn't die for angelic beings and he didn't die for animals. But he died for you and I. God in flesh. Great is the mystery of God. We can't explain it. We can't fully comprehend it. But we can believe it because God has said it in his words. And without a triune God, there is no salvation. There is no salvation. So why is the Trinity important? Because it was God the Son who died on the sins, reconciling us to the Father, who gives us eternal life. And she went to Matthew 11, 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And I and you rest. Why? Because we got access. Do you understand? We have access to God. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. We know the creator of the universe. We know the most powerful person in the universe. We know the person that knows everything about everything in the universe. It's not a small potatoes. It's not like knowing John Travolta or whoever your favorite movie star is or your football player. We know God. We have access to God. It's a big deal. You got over it yet? I'm not getting over it. That's why the Bible says no. God is a what kind of God? He's an awesome. He's not awesome one day and the next day he's just ordinary. You know how you get them new shoes? You put them on the first time, man, these shoes are awesome. You wear them about six months, you know, man, I got holes in my sleep. Throw them away. No, that ain't God. He's awesome. Every day. All day. He's awesome.
morning, SCBC and friends. Today, uh, we continue our series, What We Believe. We have been discussing the Trinity. The Bible teaches that God is triune. The Bible teaches that God is triune. The Bible teaches that God is triune. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. One God, three persons in the Godhead. Last week we talked about some ancient and modern heresies. And so, uh, uh, uh oh, Keith's not in here, so, Toby, I need your help. And, and I'm really old, makes you work too. Y'all still are too young. Got the, got the, okay. So, uh, if you would make sure everybody gets one of those, let me get one. So I want you to have this. I'm really going to turn this into a classroom today. Uh, and uh, Rachel, I bought something special for you. A packet. <laughs> uh, I used to give this to my students at the Bible College when I was dealing with this topic. So, uh, but everybody else just has the last page. And these are the three false views of the Trinity that were prominent in the ancient church, and listen to me very carefully, they're still prominent today. Right? And again, Deuteronomy 32.4, uh, thank you, uh, is it Psalm 31.5, Psalm 31.5. Yes. Um, here's what it says. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. O Lord God of truth. God is a God of truth. God only operates in the realm of truth. He doesn't operate in the realm of lies. That's Satan's domain. John 8, 44, Jesus said that Satan is the father of lies. He's been a liar from the beginning. That's all he ever tells is lies. And you understand, lies exist because there is truth. Because lies are distortions of truth. You couldn't have lies if you didn't have truth. You see? And so what Satan does is he detracts from the truth. He changes the truth. He twists the truth. You remember in the second uh, temptation, right, in Matthew 4, uh, after Jesus quoted to him, uh, in the first temptation, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes by Satan, and then he tempts him again, and, and, and Jesus quotes, and, and, and no, he tempts Jesus, and then he quotes from Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12. But what he does is he leaves out a little phrase, because he wants Jesus to commit sin, and he's using the scripture to do it. What's your point? Simply this. People take the scriptures and twist them. So just because somebody says something from the Bible, they may not be saying it in the way it should be said so that it comes across in the way that it should come across. And that's what these ancient heresies are. They're taking the truth of God's word and twisting them. And so... The first one that you see is Unitarianism. You can write above that Arianism. A R A. I I N. Thank you very much. A R I A N I S M. Arianism, because that's what it was called back in the in the fourth century. And what does Arianism, Unitarianism, believe? The Father is the Creator. The Son is. A creature and the Holy Spirit is in, in person. What's that? That's Star Wars. I was watching Star Wars last night for about when I got home, about 10 or 15 minutes, eating my peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Well, peanut butter, technically, the peanut butter and strawberry preserves because 
you just can't go bad when you eat Smuckers. I mean, you know, it's just, there's nothing better. I just didn't have any milk to go with it. Drink water, they drink a bottle of milk. But anyway, uh, that's Star Wars. The Force is with you. No. The Holy Spirit is not an impersonal current of electricity that if you plug in and you get a bolt going through you. No. The Holy Spirit is God. A person. And so, Unitarian, uh, uh, Arianism was the 4th century uh, uh, um, anti-Trinitarian teaching that was condemned at Nicaea in 325 and then fully and finally condemned at Constantinople in 381. But since Satan has nothing new to come up with, all he does is take the old lies and redress them. And so, in the 19th century, uh, Arianism became Russellism. And when Russell died, and they moved on to the next guy, they took another name, and they became known as Jehovah's Witnesses. They knock on your door every Saturday. They are promoting this ancient heresy. God's the creator, the son is the creature. No Jehovah's Witness will ever say that the son is God. I know that from personal experience, because in 1965, I've told you the story, I got caught up in the Jehovah Witness movement. I still have my Jehovah Witness Bible at home. I came home at 1 o'clock and uh, told my mother the world was ending in, in 1975, 10 years later, and only 144,000 people were going to heaven. They showed me the Bible. And she said, your world ended tonight, because I told you to come <laughs> at 11 o'clock and it's 1 o'clock. All right? So that effectively got me out of the Jehovah Witnesses. But they still, they want to come and have Bible study with you. But all they're promoting is this ancient anti-Trinitarian uh, 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 um, false view. And also Unitarianism is another form of it today. The Mormons also would fall under this. They don't believe in the Trinity. And again, I've tried to say as clearly as I can, this is not small potatoes. This is not insignificant because we're talking about God. If you got God wrong, then nothing else matters. If you don't have God right, salvation doesn't get right either. The second ancient heresy is, is uh, Sabellianism. And this was promoted by a man named Sabellius back in the uh, second, third, or fourth century. And it was also known as modalism. And we talked extensively about that last week, and I won't rehearse all of that. But uh, uh, this is the view that, you see, the Father is in the Old Testament, the Son is in the New Testament, and the Spirit is present there. What they're saying is, is that there's one person playing three roles. He's playing three roles. And this ancient heresy is what's today known as oneness Pentecostalism because they deny the doctrine of the Trinity. And what's alarming is there's an organization worldwide with over 4 million people who uh, belong to it that their official doctrinal position is the Trinity is not true. God is one. There are no three persons. And uh, God just plays three different roles. That's a heresy. And believing something that's untrue does not bring God's blessings to you. And then what we did conclude last week, and I'll just go through it real briefly, is tritheism. And this is the belief in three gods. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Three separate gods. This is what today um, Islam accuses us of because of our belief in the Trinity. I've had Muslims say, well, you believe in three gods? No, I don't. I believe in one God. I'm monotheistic, just like you. Well, you can't be, because you say the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit. That's three gods. No, it's not. Here's the problem. <laughs> uh, when we talk about that, people want to use math. They want to use arithmetic, right? And so if you use arithmetic, one plus one plus one equals three. 
But we say, no, you've got the wrong um, mathematical, uh, 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 um, what do you call it, operation. See, you need to use multiplication. One times one times one equals one. Because there's only one God. But this one God exists in three distinct persons. Three distinct persons. We hold to one God. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, is one. We believe there's one God. 1 Timothy 2, 5. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. One God. So we reject all three heresies and assert that God is one in essence, but three in person. This has been and continues to be the orthodox position on the doctrine of God's nature. So today I uh, hope to wrap up our discussion of the Trinity by discussing two diagrams, uh, Trinitarian uh, verses and passages, and the importance of this doctrine. So, uh, as I said, we've, we've looked at uh, Arianism, we've looked at uh, Monalism, which is Sabellianism, we briefly talked about Tritheism, uh, and again, it's not one plus one plus one, but it's one times one times one. We believe in one what? God. And three who's? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, uh, going forward, hmm, let's talk first about the diagrams. Uh, I need you guys' help again. <laughs> And I'm going to need some congregational assistance. So have your fingers ready and your Bibles ready because you're going to do some work today. All right? Oh, I can't just down Thank you. A lady dropped a program and I was at this pastor's celebration last week. It took me a half an hour to get to get the fish. She said, I could have got it a lot faster. I said, thanks, Now I haven't been over. All right. So, the, your uh, handout, I, I mean, I'm sorry, your, uh, your uh, sermon note page, two diagrams. And uh, so I want to talk about those. Uh, and uh, I want you to help me by reading some passage of Scripture. Uh, these are two, the, the ontological trend is, is really um, an ancient illustration. Uh, of course, my little illustration is good as some others. Uh, and if you want to see what it looks like, you can go to Rachel. She has it with a nice, nice picture of it. <laughs> but this is an ancient diagram of the Trinity. And what, what I want you to know is F is the Father, S is the Son, H is the Holy Spirit. And there's a line that goes into the center which says the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. So I want you to write these references down, but I also want us to read them. So, uh, 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 Teresa, can you start us off? Ephesians 1, 2. All right? Uh, uh, yes? Okay, we'll start with you. Ephesians 1, 2, then we'll go to you, uh, uh, um, Aurelio, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. The Father is God. Yeah, go ahead. Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. That's the vision. Oh, two, I'm sorry. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. God our Father. I mean, how could you miss that? It's clear. It's, it's not like it's amb amb ambiguous or fuzzy. God our Father. That's what it says. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says... Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. See, for us there's how many gods? One. There's not three. There's one. But he's called our Father. The Father. So, and, and we couldn't 
multiply this endlessly, but we have limited amount of time in the message. So those are just two references. That's enough to say, yeah, the Bible clearly calls the Father God. Can't miss that. All right? The Son is God. Uh, uh, Michelle, uh, John 20, 28, and Teresa, Titus 2.13. Yes, this is more like a classroom setting, Della, uh, than, than a preaching setting. So you're back, you're in school on Sunday. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Michelle. John 20, 28. Um, and Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Who's he talking to? Jesus. And Jesus said, No, don't call me God. Is that, is, what the, is that what the next verse says? No, it doesn't say that. What does it say? The next verse, Jesus said to me, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus never said, don't call me God. <laughs> he would never say that. You know why? He because he's God. He's not a creature. He's God. Uh, Titus 2.13. And I've told you a hundred times when the job witness is knocking on my door, my question is, who's Jesus? We don't need to talk about nothing now. Who's Jesus? Don't close, don't hide, you know, pull the curtains, cut the lights off, tell the kids to be quiet. Open the door. Don't let them in, but open the door. Ask them who's Jesus. And then take them to Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And ask them two questions. Is Jesus the Savior? And they all, they will say yes. Then say, is he God? And they will say no. no. Then ask them, what is that little three-letter word, A-N-D, doing? It's connecting God and Savior as it describes Jesus. <coughs> Very clear. Very clear. We're not making it up. It's very clear. The Bible says that the Son, Jesus, is God. All right, thirdly, the Holy Spirit is God. Acts 5, uh, uh, Chris, 3 and 4, and then Dylan, uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 17. All right, I'm coming to you, visitors. Yeah, you had to come. You got to work today, brother. <laughs> There's no free church today. <laughs> you got to work. <laughs> All right, uh, 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 Chris. When Peter said, hey, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep that part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own? Was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. In verse 3, he says you lied to? Holy and then in verse 4, he says you lied to? God. Holy Spirit is God. Holy Spirit is God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.17 Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Lord is the Spirit. The Lord is just another designation for God. The Lord is the Spirit. The Spirit is the Lord. The Spirit is God. It's real clear. It's not fuzzy. It's not ambiguous. It's scriptural. Man, does everybody agree? Obviously they don't. We've just went over three major heretical groups, and they number in the millions. So we're not talking about five or ten people. There's a Jehovah Witness Church, a Kingdom Hall, right down the street. There's one around the corner on uh, Prince of Garden Parkway. And every time I drive by, the parking lot is full. So we're not talking about some little inky, binky, dinky group that don't have any impact. Listen, they're impacting thousands, millions of people's lives with this lie. And you know what? It's leading people away from God, not to God. Because when you got a distorted view of God, that view is not the God of the Bible. 
It's not the view of the God of the Bible. God's very clear about who he is. That's why he's given us this revelation of himself. Just because we can't fully comprehend it doesn't mean it's not true. And our believing it is not contingent on us having a full comprehension. Do you understand the arrogancy of that? People always say, I don't believe something I, I, I don't understand. Well, you must don't, you must don't believe too much or nothing because there's a whole lot of things that people can't explain. You explain how electricity works? Well, I'm sure Chris could. Ball can. Ball can. Okay? I can't tell you how it works. Just, I know to plug something in the, in the socket over there. There's a whole lot of things that you and I believe in that we can't fully explain or comprehend. How does those pictures come through the TV too? There you go. Planes. Do you know how heavy? Try to lift a plane. Try to lift a car. We ain't even talking about a plane. And yet it, it, it gets off the ground. You've flown in a plane before. And you're flying planes with people that talk to you over an intercom system. You don't know if they're up front or not. You don't know if they they sitting in some airport just broadcasting to the thing and you because we don't go up there and ask, can I see the pilot? <laughs> and even if you went up there and saw him, and you said, I want to see your credentials, he could have fake credentials. You don't get off, I ain't flying with him. <laughs> no, you get on the plane, you go. So that's nonsense. Here's the issue. Does the word of God teach this, or does it not? Does it, it, the issue is not, do I fully understand it? Faith takes us beyond the limitation of reason. Listen to me very carefully. Faith takes you beyond the limitation of human reason. Because all of us are finite beings. All of us have limitations. No matter who the smartest person in this room is, Doc Ann, <laughs> still don't know everything. <laughs> and no matter how many degrees you get behind your name, Toby, uh, Rebecca, <laughs> Dylan, you still not going to know everything. Nobody does. Only God does. So we need to be very careful about telling God he's wrong when he knows everything. And he has revealed himself as a Trinitarian God. So let me just talk about the ontological trinity real briefly. See, it, the onto, ontology deals with being, existence. So the nature of being. And so, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. They are distinct persons. So we've got to look at two verses real quick. John 10.30. <laughs> uh, John 10.30. Uh, Say hi, my father are one. No? Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. 10.30. He said, he said, I and my father are one. I'm still getting there. Okay, well, you already said it, though. <laughs> I, I, I thought that was it. I thought that was it. All right. Yep. John got you to memorize that verse 30 years ago. I and my father are one. Yep, right. I had it. I, I thought that was it. I had it. I had it. There you go. I and my father are one. What's he talking about? Equality of essence. I and my father are one. Equality of essence. Because they're both God. The Father is God, the Son is God. Equality of essence. Let's go. Um, Paul. Paul? Yes. To John 14, 28. Because this is where people will take you and say, you see, there's no Trinity. Because of 14, 28, which says, You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Mm -hmm. See that? Jesus said the Father is greater than I, so he can't be equal to him. No. Why is he saying that? Because it's a difference of function. And so that leads us to the top diagram. The difference of function. The economic trinity. The ontological trinity deals with the equality of essence. Equal in essence. 
But the economic trinity, you see that little paren I put, the roles assumed for the outworking of the divine plan and the running of the universe. This is the economic trinity. They are equal in essence, but in function, the Son and the Spirit took a subordinate role to the Father. The essence didn't change. And that's illustrated in marriage. Galatians 3.28. There's neither male nor female, Jew nor Gentile, and, and the other things he says in the verse, but we're all one. What is he talking about? He's talking about equality, that's before God. But when you go to Ephesians 5, he says, wives, submit to your husbands. Well, wait a minute, we equal. Yes equal in standing before God, but for the purpose of marriage working, God says wife has to take a subordinate position. You're not less than your husband. Actually, Carolyn runs the finances in the house because she's better at business stuff than I am. Okay? But God says this is way, the way I want the marriage to function. You're equal. A husband and wife have equal spiritual position before God, equal spiritual blessings before God. You're equal before God. But to function as a family, God says, husband is the head, wife is underneath of the husband, and the children are underneath both of them. Oh, really? Why? How did that come about? Well, let's look at this. So let's go to who's up? Somebody's up. Linda. Linda, John 6.44. And then over you're going to have uh, John 14.26. John 6.44? Yes. Yes. No man can come to me except the Father which has set me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So Jesus said, who sent him? The Father sent him. He didn't send the Father. The Father did what? <laughs> sent him. All right, Obi? You said 1428? 26. But the helper of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So the Father sent who? He sent the Holy Spirit. The Father sent the Son, but the Father also sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit didn't send the Father. Okay? Now, let's go to John 16, 7. Uh, uh, Alan? Alan? Alan?
The Father, and the, the Spirit, and the Son subordinated themselves to the Father. And then the Spirit subordinated himself to the Son. And by the way, um, this uh, and the Son is called a philoki. That's the way I say it, the Greek term. Uh, that and the Son was inserted into the Nicene Creed. And as a result of that, the people in the, in the, in the uh, East, that was a theological issue that called the church to split in 1054. Because they never wanted to agree to the fact that the, the Son sent the Spirit. I don't know how you don't agree with it when it, he clearly says, I sent him. I, mean, I just don't get it. I mean, there's a whole lot of other things I don't get, too. I, I don't get how uh, Roman Catholicism promotes uh, um, um, celibacy in the priesthood. And they, but they claim to go back to Peter. But the problem is that Jesus went in and healed Peter's mother-in-law. I mean, come on, how do you come up with this stuff? Because, see, you don't agree with God. You ignore what God says, or you twist it, or you turn it some kind of way to agree with what you wanted to say. And so, as I was saying, I was reading this guy uh, last week uh, that heads the UPCI, and he says, no, it's modalism or oneness, uh, oneness the theology, the the the. the the Father is, is Jesus incarnate. What? And, and the Father is the Holy Spirit. What? How do you come up with that? Well, you see, his presuppositions, because he wants to protect, and this was the ancient heresy of modalism, protect this biblical idea that there's one God. Therefore, I can't accept the, the later revelation God gives that there's one God exists in three persons. I got to say, those are just modes. But they end up teaching heresy. Heresy. Oh, where's that verse I found? You know it's good to read your Bible. <laughs> it, it really is. Uh, everybody turn to Titus. This was one of those verses I found <laughs> this week when I was reading my Bible. And uh, just in case you don't think this is a serious issue, Here's what the Word of God says. Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. So you know what I was reading this weekend. I was reading Titus. <laughs> All right? Verse uh, 10. Did I say 10 and 11? You said 3, 10 11. Okay. Reject the... Uh, oh, I need a King James. See, the new, even the new King James, man. Who got King James? A man has his hand. I need King James. New King James. No, King James. I got New King James. A tablet, man. <laughs> no tablet. Wow, <laughs> man. Oh, the Word of God. Hey, Keith, you old enough to know better. Ain't nobody under 50 supposed to be working with one of them things. That's, that's his generation. You got the holiest thing. You got to be able to press it to your chest and tap that thing. In. You know? Got all these devices and all this stuff. <sighs> all right. All right. Uh, Titus 3, 10, 11. This is King James. A man that is a heretic after the first and, ex and second admonition reject. See, you don't keep arguing with people. You tell them the truth. If they don't respond to it, don't get mad. Just don't hang around with them because you'll get infected. Verse 11, knowing that he that is, is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. That's what God says. Oh, well, Pastor Lawson, this is not no big deal. Yes, it is. Because God says when you take, teach heresy, you're condemned. Okay. Well, they're nice people. Yeah, okay. Nice people go to hell. Only saved people go to heaven. So it's, it is a big deal. It is serious. You can't hold to a false view and expect God's blessing. You can. Doctrine is important. Why? Because God is the one who gives it. We're not making this stuff up. It's not my particular bent. It has nothing to do with being an American. It has everything to do with what has God said what does God mean? Do I agree with God? That's 
what you got to ask yourself. Because see, when you meet Jesus, I'm not going to be with you. I can't say nothing in your behalf. You got to talk for yourself. And just like when I meet Jesus, I got to talk for myself too. And not going to be a long conversation since he already know everything you said and did. It's going to be real brief. Did you do what I said to do? It's either yes or no. He already knows. Did you believe what I had in my word? You know, it'd be like Saul. Samuel shows up. Did you kill all that Malachite? Yes, sure did. Well, what's this bleeding of sheep I had? And what's Agar still doing alive? Well, well, you know, I wanted to have a sacrifice for God. He got real spiritual. <laughs> and Samuel said, you'd have lost the kingdom. It's gone. Because you don't obey God. You can half obey, but that's still disobedience. And he lost the kingdom because of it. Well, let me hustle on. So that's the ontological and the economic trinity. Now let me give you some passages, and uh, let's just look at a few. Uh, and all of these passages are used by, especially these ones that's been, I'm, I'm amazed, I'm reading this guy's book, and he twists all of these verses to come up with his presuppositional views about the fact that there is no trinity. But here are the verses, verses that teach the trinity. Let's start in Matthew. And of course, this is probably the most well-known one. Matthew 28, 19. And just for time's sake, I'll, I'll just go ahead and read uh, Matthew 28, 19. And you can just jot them down and you can't turn to them as fast as you look at them later. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Trinitarian verses. Romans uh, 15, 30. Romans 15, 30. And here's what it says. Romans 15, 30. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Lord Jesus Christ, Spirit, and God. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 is another well-known Trinitarian verse. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. And here's what it says, the last verse of the book. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Sound like three people to me. Ephesians 2.18, one of my favorite verses. Well, my favorite verse just happened to be the one I'm in at that moment. This is my favorite verse right there. Ephesians 2.18. For through him, reference to Christ, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Through him, Christ, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. I got to stop there for a moment. Give a shout out to God. Oh my goodness. Through him. How you getting to God? Not through Buddha. Yes. Not through um, Allah. Not through any other religion. It's through Him. Why we get excited about Jesus? Because it's through Him that we have access by the Spirit to the Father. Do you understand why there was a veil between the Holy of Holies and the Holy? Because nobody could go into God's presence. The high priest went in once a year. Once a year, he had to have blood on him. But you and I can go into God's presence. Why? Because we're covered in the blood of Christ. We got access. I don't know about you, but I like that. Listen, Sasha and Malia go up there and knock on that gate of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. We want to see our father. And you know what? The gates just swing open. You go up there and try to get in. <laughs> Man, no, you, yeah, you might get shot, but you be in some psych ward. They be examining you for the next 35 years, trying to figure out what's wrong with you. But you and I can come right up to the throne of grace. Because we got access to God. I hope you use your access. 
He says, come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And when are you not in need? I'm in need all the time. I need my wife to come home. <laughs> come home. We're in need. And God says, I can meet your need. Uh, um, yesterday, uh, all right, what's the correct pronunciation? Rochelle. Thank you very much. Rochelle. She was so excited. She had gone to this youth rally thing, and she was just busting out. She wanted to have a whole Bible study. I was trying to get this out there. She made us out tracks. Rochelle wanted to have a Bible study. So I said, well, just do one. And she went to Matthew 11, 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and the heavy laden. And I... Why? Because we got access. Do you understand? We have access to God. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. We know the creator of the universe. We know the most powerful person in the universe. We know the person that knows everything about everything in the universe. It's not a small potatoes. It's not like knowing John Travolta. <laughs> or whoever your favorite movie star is, or your football player, you, we know God. We have access to God. It's a big deal. You got over it yet? I'm not getting over it. That's why the Bible says no. God is a, what kind of God? He's an awesome. <laughs> He's not awesome one day and the next day. He's just ordinary. You know how you get them new shoes? You put them on the first time, man, these shoes are awesome. You wear them about six months, you know, man, I got holes in my shoes. Throw them away. Now, that ain't God. He's awesome. Every day. All day. He's awesome. Allie, remember when we first saw? Uh, 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 um, Obi. Obi. I know you, you ain't say it out loud because you didn't want to give yourself away. He's awesome! Look at that guy! Man, he's a big strapping. Yeah. I hope you're still saying awesome. Oh no. I know you're still saying awesome about the time. Yeah, he's awesome! That's right. But you see, God's awesome all the time. We should never become so familiar with God that it's just, you know, God is red, he's my dad. No. God's awesome. And we know him. I, don't, I mean, what floats your boat? That floats my boat every day. I know God. I can come into God's presence because of Jesus Christ. Amen. For through him, we have access by one spirit unto the Father. Okay, okay, let me go on. And then, 1 John 5, 7. And I deliberately chose this verse and had uh, uh, Chris put it on the marquee. Because, of course, this is the verse that everybody disputes. All right, and I'm not going to get into a long discussion of it. But here's what it says. For well, there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And, of course, if you uh, would read any non King James uh, uh, Bible, this verse is not in it. Here's what the NIV says in verse 7. For there are three that testify, and then it skips. That's verse, That's the end of verse 6. It skips verse 7 and goes to verse 8. The spirit, the water, and the blood, and, th and these three are in agreement. The ESV does the same thing. For there are three that testify. Verse 8. The spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree. The NASB for there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are in agreement. The Holman Christian Standard Bible. For there are three that testify, verse 8, because they drop verse 7. The spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three are in agreement. The new, new revised standard version. There are three that testify, verse 8, because it doesn't have a verse 7. The spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are agreed. The RSV, and the spirit is the witness because the spirit is the truth. Verse 8, there are three witnesses, the spirit, the water, the blood, and the three agree. And I purposely chose the verse 
because I know it's a controversial verse. It's a verse that many say uh, was an insertion, and only the King James and the New King James uh, um, uh, use it. All other English translations dropped it because they say it's not in the most ancient manuscripts. And you can go back and forth on that. We did a whole thing on it when I was in uh, one of my uh, seminary classes. But here's, here's the point of why I used it. I used it because you don't need it to prove the Trinity. We've looked at another, enough passages in the Bible that clearly teach the Trinity. So these people come along and say, well, 1 John 5, 7, no, that ain't in the Bible. And they argue, you know, it's only in eight manuscripts and da 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 If you take it out, the Trinity is still taught in the New Testament. It's still taught. So you can argue about 1 John 5, 7. You can go back and forth. You can, you can get all of the ancient manuscripts and show that it wasn't in certain ones and it was only in a few in, in this century and that century. But so what? The Trinity is not hinged upon that one verse. That's the point. That's why I used it. Because I know that's the most controversial verse. And the verse clearly teaches the Trinity. But those who are anti-Trinitarian, they make a big deal. You know, they write books about how that verse is not in the Bible. Okay, fine. But we can see from other passages that it's clearly teaching. I'm just going to give you these. We're not going to turn to them and read them. I gave you Trinitarian verses where we saw all three in a verse. Now I'm going to give you Trinitarian passages. And here's what's interesting about these passages. They all have the same scope. Listen as I give them to you. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 6. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. And Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 to 6. Now let's just turn to one. Uh, Ephesians 4. And by the way, these are not the only Trinitarian passages. I, I was reading it <laughs> Friday, I think it was, and I ran across them one. I was marking them up. I can't put everything in. All right? But just Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. All right? There is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called into one hope, you were called in one, a reference to Christ, one faith, one baptism, and and one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. <laughs> and if you go and look at all of the rest of them, you'll see the same thing. So they're Trinitarian verses, they're Trinitarian passages. The Trinity is not a, a, a little biblical teaching hiding up in some corner that we went and pulled out and made it, blew it up and made this big deal about. No, 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 no. It's all over the New Testament. Why? Because God wants you to understand that he's a Trinitarian God. That's the point. And if you want to get him right, you got to get that right. And it is important. I'll talk about that just real briefly. So all these passages, all these verses and all these passages teach unequivocally that the one God exists as three persons. Mystery, yes. Beyond our full comprehension, yes but taught in the Bible and expected to be believed and embraced, yes. For to repeat, I'm sorry, for to reject the Trinity is to reject God, who has revealed himself as a Trinity. Why is the Trinity important to you? I will give what I believe is the most important reason, and there are others, but this, in my mind, is the most important reason why the Trinity is important and important to every one and every Christian. And it is this. Without the Trinity, there is no salvation. Without the Trinity, there is no salvation. Without the Trinity, there is no Savior. Two final verses. Acts 20, 28. We've already read it, but just real quickly, Acts, no, we didn't read this. Acts 20, 28. Acts 20, 28. Paul is with the Ephesian elders, and this is what he says to them. 
Verse 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he, the he is a, referring back to God, purchased with his own blood. What? John 4, 24 says God's a spirit. Spirit don't have blood. But this says God purchased it with his own blood. And then 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16. Everybody knows John 3.16, but every Christian ought to know 1 Timothy 3.16. Because this is what it said, and this is why I like the King James Version. All right? First Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. That's how Acts 20.28, 20, God could shed his blood. Because God the Father sent God the Son. And he became incarnated, John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of, of God in him. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrated his love for us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God incarnate died for us. God the Son died for us. The Father did not die for us. The Spirit did not die for us. But God the Son became flesh and blood and died at Calvary. That's why human beings can be redeemed. That's why angels who sinned and became demons can't be redeemed. That's why animals can't be redeemed. Because Jesus became a man and died for mankind. He didn't die for angelic beings and he didn't die for animals. But he died for you and I. God in flesh. Great is the mystery of God. We can't explain it. We can't fully comprehend it. But we can believe it because God has said it in his words. And without a triune God, there is no salvation. There is no salvation. So why is the Trinity important? Because it was God the Son who died on the sins, reconciling us to the Father, who gives us eternal life eternal life. Well, let me close by asking you to turn to your hymn book. In the back here, 717. And in 325, they came up with this creed, which was amended in 381. And this is the version that is used today. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of lights, very God of very God, begotten that made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made a man and crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall not have no end and I believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord and giver of life who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who was with the Father and the Son together, is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. A Trinitarian a document that has stood the test of time from the third, fourth century when it was first comprised representing the biblical teaching that God is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the reason all of this is so is because he provided salvation for us. 
the triune God did. And if we believe that God is less than triune, there is no salvation. That's why it's important to you. That's why it's important to me. That's why it's important to all people. Because the triune God, and only the triune God, could provide salvation for our soul. And so Frederick Faber says, Oh, blessed Trinity, oh, simplest majesty, all three in one, thou art forever God alone. Holy Trinity, blessed equal three, one God, we praise thee. Amen. Amen. Where are we, Sidney? Page 30. Page 30. So let's stand and sing page 30. salvation. And so we thank you that God the Son was incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ our Lord. And he went to the cross and God shed his blood for us there. And because of the blood of Jesus, we are cleansed from our sins. We who have called upon Jesus for salvation are cleansed from our sins. And only through Jesus can we come to you Heavenly Father, by your Spirit. And so we bless your name and we praise you, Triune God. We worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, for you are God. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Bless us as we dismiss and return to our homes. May we do so with rejoicing. In Christ's name, amen. Bless you as you go.